Hello, my name is Carlton Farmer, and I'm an interviewer with the Public Library of Cincinnati and Hamilton County. And I'm interviewing Francis Ruggery on June 29, 2006, at the Main Library. So you were telling me earlier, sir, about um, trying to enlist into the Army. Uh, what's the story about you getting involved in, in, in military service? When my father uh, passed away when I was four years old, and I was told that he died by virtue of being gassed in World War I. He was a 15-year-old immigrant from Italy and he volunteered to go in the United States Army at that time. And uh, growing up was pretty difficult for me without a father in the area where we lived, Tamaqua, Pennsylvania. And uh, I missed my father. And so I grew up wanting to be a soldier. My friends were playing cowboys and Indians. But I wanted to be a soldier so that I could someday get a little vendetta for my father's passing and my being denied that father guidance. So when it came time to graduate from high school, we get into World War II that was on the horizon, and I was ready to go to the point where I had even taken some friends of mine who already were in the military, and when they would come home on leave, I'd have them teach me the close order drill, the marching. I had them teach me the manual of arms, how you handle your rifle. And uh, I knew all of those basic things before I ever took the pledge because I was eager to go. When I convinced my mother that I had to do this against her wishes, I had to go to the Army. I went to Allentown, Pennsylvania to, uh, to volunteer. And uh, the, the Army branch was the most eager there to get those young recruits. So that's why I went first into the Army recruiter. Um, I went through the physical, filled out some papers, and uh, they turned me down for a physical reason. Well, I was disappointed, but this, I knew it was going to make my mother happy. So, so I went home and gave her the good news. But about two months later, I got this greetings from the uh, government telling me that uh, I was eligible for the draft and I was going to be drafted. So that's the procedure I went through. I was drafted into the Army. But they originally wouldn't take me when I wanted to volunteer. But I guess as the, as the Army was growing, they might get a little more relaxed in their physical requirements and decided to take me after all. Mm -hmm. Did your mom have you said your mother didn't really want you to go into the military. Did she have other plans for you, or did she have sort of high aspirations for you to do something different? Or? No, we just come out of a depression, and uh, with no income, no father, it was pretty tough. Right. So, uh, no, there was no, no looking down the road for college. That was out of the question. But uh, uh, she realized that I had this desire to kind of square things up for my dad that she turned me loose. She also, in the meantime, talked to some politicians in a little coal mining town. And they told her that I'd be eligible for a deferment because of her being a widow, no income, and two children. I had a baby sister. I could have got a deferment and went to work and uh, provided income for our family, but I didn't. I wanted to go in. 
So, um, did, at any point had you had you uh, held down the job and been, like you said, about sort of making income for the family? Had you been the sort of the person who had done that, or what did your mother do to get through to get by? It seems like during the depression, without having a father, would be a difficult. It was very difficult. Very difficult. I knew what it was prior to going in. I knew what it was to go to the armory, which was a military uh, for National Guard unit in that town. And it was a distribution point for what we called relief. Today it's known as welfare. And uh, I knew what it was to go to that point of distribution and get in line to get our uh, supply for food, which was usually the large institutional sized cans that you see in restaurants that they use, the large cans and large uh, loaves of cheese. I knew what it was to get a box of them and carry them home on Saturday. So that helped us get by. But I did work part-time in high school with summer jobs for the four years between gas stations and uh, grocery store, little neighborhood grocery store. I was in my fair share of that too. Yeah, right. So uh, uh, the nice uh, memories I have there is that I sold gasoline for 14 and a half cents a gallon. <laughs> Uh, this morning on the way here, I saw a sign 296.9. So it's come a long way. So, so you get drafted into the military. I'm, I'm guessing that was you were very excited and glad that that, that, that happened. I was glad to I had to say goodbye and get on the train. Sure. How much time transpired between when you got your draft notice and when you were called up? Oh, but uh, they gave me. We took the physical in about 30 to 45 days. I had to go to be sworn in. Went back to Allentown, got sworn in. They told me to give me 30 days at home to clean up anything I wanted to do for my mom and uh, that I'd be reporting uh, on December 22, 44. And that was difficult because it was right before Christmas. Okay. So getting on that train and saying goodbye with the Christmas lights on and everybody getting the spirit. Something about was, a movie or something. Yeah, it was yeah. Cool. yeah. I can imagine it would be tough. Yeah. So you said from, from there, what was the first place you headed? To a uh, distribution area known as uh, Cumberland Gap. Cumberland Gap was up towards, uh, it was northeast of uh, Tamak. Only about 60, 70 miles. That's where uh, I reported, and I was assigned there to a uh, cavalry outfit, a re recon cavalry outfit that was to be stationed down in Fort Hood, Texas. It was Camp Hood in those days. But uh, that's where I, we loaded up on this train and traveled for so it seems an eternity to get to Texas because the secrecy, the routes that they were taking were very secret uh, because of sabotage. Trains could be grown up on the way to camp. But I uh, got to Texas and uh, from that point on, I was so busy. I had so many things to do that there was no time to be homesick. I miss my fresh seafood. I love seafood, but it was before refrigeration, and they weren't flying seafood in to restaurants in Texas. So it just did without, and I got very, that would make me homesick when I couldn't get my clams and my shrimp. What type, what, what was the, what was your memory of the food like when you were in the RA? Different places better, or did you, was it? Of the life that I was living in? Like I say, you didn't get, you didn't get to a point where you got the life anyways. Mm, sure. Uh, you were just, uh, 
on the go and basic training was extremely rigorous and uh, and uh, you slept good. <laughs> and that, like yeah. stone. So you see, sometimes you fell asleep crying, you know. But probably woke up crying too. Well, that could happen, I guess. Waking up, you didn't get time to even think. We used to have to prepare and fall out and report like at 6.30 in the morning. Well, that meant at 5.30, we were doing a five mile march prior to breakfast. So you didn't think about it the future very much. You just wondered if you were going to survive from the one challenge to the next. Certainly interesting, to say the least. Yeah, yeah. So, so after basic training, um, what, was, uh, what was the first place sort of overseas that you went? After basic training, I was, uh, well, I, I, made a, I made a PFC. I got a stripe. Single stripe, and I was very proud of that because the cavalry don't give out rankings very often, or of any degree. But I was so successful in the basic because I'd done my homework before I went in. I knew the manual of arms and the close order drill, so I became a PFC. And by doing so, I got rewarded. They sent me to a school to. Uh, get an education in a specific field, which was armorer school, where we learned uh, the capability of different weapons, from the Colt 45 pistol to the 75 howitzer cannon. And, uh, and that was uh, a very interesting course. That was held in Fort Riley, Kansas. We had to uh, break down all the weapons in between. We'd break them down to what we call field level. We took them apart when we wanted to clean the dirt and the rust, whatever. We'd clean them out, blindfolded, and put them together against the clock, against time, to see how proficient you could be in, in combat to do those things, repair a gun, clean a gun. If you're at night on patrol, then maybe you got snow on it or mud, and uh, certainly came in handy down the road. But I enjoyed Fort Riley. It was kind of a, it was kind of a, a nice life. It was a, a permanent military base that's still in existence and still has horses. Horses are only used for training and for show in Washington for ceremonies up there. But that, uh, I enjoyed that. I love the horses. Love those horses. And then they took them away and they mechanized us, mechanized cavalry. And, uh, we had to take better care of the horse than we did our cheap or our armored car or tank. But uh, there was a bond in there with your horse. That was uh, something you didn't forget, which you never had with a tank or a jeep. <laughs> so the first, the first time that they, that they, so you were in Riley, Kansas. Was it, a, was it a while there? I mean, you said it was a permanent structure. Did it feel? I was so there for about uh, two months. Okay. In the meantime, my outfit was down on uh, maneuvers in uh, New Orleans. My outfit was the 125th Cavalry Recon. They were down in, not in New Orleans, down in, uh, I guess, Brown Shreveport, Louisiana. A lot of swamp area. Uh, I was going on my way down to join them to prepare to go overseas. And, uh, I got delayed because of my travel orders weren't complete. These maneuvers were out in the field 
and there's no buses, there's no trains run out there. And so I did a lot of walking to find my outfit. And sometimes overnight, walking to, uh, to, to locate them. Because they were in the field playing war. And, uh, but we got together eventually and then prepared to be shipped overseas. Prior to that, they did give us a two week furlough. What did you do with that? I went home to get some seafood and see my mom. <laughs> and, uh, but I'll tell you this I got so lonesome for the friends that I'd made in the military. I was so into my job in the military. I knew I was good and I was ready to perform that I didn't stay home the full two weeks. I left early to the displeasure of my mother, but I wanted to get back and get the job done and come home for good. So I think I was home about 11 days and left to get back. And uh, from there on, boy, it was uh, a great ride to the coast where we got on what was known as Liberty Ship, which are all freighters converted to troop carriers. And uh, they were ugly. And they were dirty. And they were small. And when you're being shipped to the North Atlantic uh, in the winter, it's a pretty treacherous ride. Needless to say, I became a non-com with my armor school training and some open, some vacancies. I became a corporal, and they called the corporal, they called the non-commissioned officers aside aboard this freighter and told us now that we were the leaders, that we had to set the example for the rest of our, our, our troops. So they didn't want you getting seasick. Well, I'm an Easterner and I thought, you know, I, I've been to Rockaway Beach, uh, New York. I've been in the ocean, I think I can handle it. But these poor guys from, from Iowa, I don't know how they're going to handle it. They never saw the ocean. So I was pretty confident that I was going to be able to handle them and, and help them with their problems. Well, they tell me seasickness is mostly mental. And as a result, uh, I was overconfident and boy, I was sick for 13 consecutive days. That's how long it took to get to uh, uh, the British Isles. Sea sickness for 13 days. Talk about living in filth. But we were so fortified with injections, our bodies were so built up from the basic training that we could survive anything it looked like. We were getting inoculations even aboard ship. One inoculation I got is where you pulled up your sweatshirt, your undershirt, and they injected you in the back of your arm. And then you climbed the ladder to get out of this hole so that the next guy could go get his injection. And I'm halfway up the ladder when they said, any of you guys have a syringe still sticking in your arm. And so everybody's on this ladder holding on, trying to get their shirts up to see if they got a, a feel for a syringe. And sure enough, sure enough, I had one in my arm. So I was just removed by the guy behind me, passed it on down. I don't know if it was reused or not. In those days, it wasn't too much. Uh, 
no rubber gloves or sanit sanitation wasn't very much uh, practiced. But that was one of the, uh, the shot didn't bother me. Leaving the needle in there did. I didn't sleep for a while. Too, sleep, too sick to sleep anyhow. But that's the trip over. So then from uh, the British Isles, uh, you landed there, and so what was the next step from there on? We pulled up in the northern part of the uh, northwest uh, part of Isle of uh, England, and that's where I got my first glimpse of land, and it was Ireland. What a beautiful sight. The beautiful green, uh, green all the way from the hillside down to the, to the water. Just like green carpet. Beautiful sight. And then the next thing I realized is I heard bagpipe music. And sure enough, and I'm in Scotland. I'm going to get off in Scotland. And they had this band there to greet us. And I'm sorry to say to this day, I didn't appreciate the music put up by bagpipes. Of course, I'm 19 years old too. But uh, I wasn't too related over that. But was I happy to get on solid ground again? That was good. And from there we got in big trucks and were taken down into England. And uh, that was kind of a thing that took getting used to. I figured in the United States from my trip from Tamaqua, Pennsylvania, the Fort Hill, Texas, I went through quite a few states. Well, in England, uh, you go from northern England to southern England, you do it all, and you're still in England. You don't go to another state. It, uh, it just seemed that, oh, it's an awful small country, which it is compared to the United States. But we got down to, uh, oh, probably 100 kilometers from London at an intersection called Lobscombe Corners. And uh, there was a camp there made up of Quonset huts. Those are like half barrel type of buildings that housed the uh, oh, 100 troops. A little stove in the middle to give you heat and concrete with. Uh, bunk beds. The first bed was about four inches from the floor, and the second bed was about four feet above the first one. And they weren't beds, they were just made out of crates that other equipment was shipped over in. And they had metal straps, no springs, anything. Metal strapping that was around these crates. And then you had a big, huge, bag of straw, which was a mattress cover, but no mattress. You filled it with straw and you flattened it out. And that's what we slept on while we were in England. So, uh, although that took a little getting used to, there were a lot of times I wished I had it back when I was had to sleep in a foxhole or in a gravesite or in church people that uh, that little Quonset out in England would be pretty good. Yeah. Uh, okay. To make you know what you can get used to after a while. And you have no recourse. There's no options. You do what you're told to do. Now, and you, your division did, so your troop did some reconnaissance work. Did yeah. a lot of reconnaissance work. Yeah. Talk a little about that, what, what went into that, and, and who you did your kind of okay. work for. We did some additional training in England. Uh, we worked out, we were assigned to the 5th Ranger Battalion, which was an experimental thing at the time, the Rangers, now known as Special Troops. Well, it's still known as Rangers, but it was classified as Special Troops today. Uh, I had the pleasure of uh, having a captain, a commander by the name of Captain Eichner, a great American, and he was in charge of this ranger division, or 
squadron in England that we trained alongside with them. He was very receptive of us. We knew they were the elite. They were the elite armed force of the United States. We knew that. So any, they were all the motivation we needed to learn and do a good job and not to give up, to, to stay the course. So a training with them over there was very beneficial. And in combat, Captain Eichner was captured twice by the Germans. He was an officer who led his men. He led them in the combat. He was the one who directed them or told them where to strike. He led them. And consequently, he was captured twice and happy to say was rescued twice. So that's 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 one of the nice stories of the war. Of the war. And uh, when we were going down to Southampton to board the barges to take us across the channel for the invasion, we were told that we were going to be back up to the Rangers, that the Rangers had a very high-risk mission. They were to take Point the Hawk, which uh, had paratroopers out there the night before, and then the Rangers were to scale these cliffs that were 100 to 120 feet high. Now these were not hillsides, these were not beaches, this was a rock that came out of the ocean. And you scaled up them with the use of a, a toggle rope. That's a piece of equipment that the Rangers used. They called it a toggle rope. Toggle rope. And it was exactly that, a piece of rope with a loop that you braided in one end. At the other end of it, about 36 inches, 40 inches down, was a piece of hardwood, oh, like maybe the handle of a baseball bat. That was also braided around this wood so it wouldn't come out. And you could do a lot of things with that rope. You could climb with it, you could use it to tow vehicles, you could kill a man with it. It was a very handy piece of equipment that we probably wore around our on one shoulder. But we're going to be back up for these rangers. There was only so many of them available. And uh, and uh, not many of them made it. But they did. They did. They made it. <coughs> Wiped out the huge concrete bunkers that were up there. Uh, an unbelievable accomplishment. And we're there waiting to be the next wave if needed. But we were needed. Thanks to those great kids. But then we laid in the channel there for a couple of days. The weather was terrible. Rain constantly, it was dark. I have to say that when I was in the English Channel, until after I get in to a beachhead, I don't remember much daylight. Everything was always pitch dark with shells bursting, trace of bullets flying all over. Everything was wet. It was sick. See sickness again, because it was choppy in that channel. We thought that the invasion was going to be called off because they were wrong when they got the weather reports and the tide reports weren't accurate. And uh, they went in against all odds. 
We laid out there for days. I don't know how long I put up with that darkness. I don't know how long I was wet. I know I lost my men. We were no longer on barges. I remember walking through deep water. I remember having been overloaded with ammunition and weapons, grenades. A steel helmet filled the thing over the ton. But I don't uh, have any indication of how many days we just floundered around in the dark and wetness and pushing some of the dead aside so you could continue on walking through the water to get to the beach. said in the cavalry you didn't get many stripes. They weren't given out until they needed an emergency replacement. Uh, I actually lost my I lost my crew, I lost my platoon. There's so much uh, confusion, so much darkness, so much wet, so much cold that it was an effort just to keep going, let alone find who you were supposed to be with, where your men were. You hoped everybody was all right. I do remember a non-commissioned officer telling me to come with him. And uh, he took most of the equipment I had and he threw it away. I said, hang on to your gun and the bandolier of ammunition. You won't need this, you don't need that. And he took me to a, uh, what looked like a big tarpaulin with some tree branches on it. Found out it was a command headquarters for an artillery group. And you had to go down through a mud slide to get in it. So he took me into this little area, very small, very tight, where there were two other soldiers, one an officer. And uh, the sergeant told the officer, he said, I brought him in because he's confused, he's dazed, he's not wounded, but uh, he's very disoriented. I brought him in to get a cup of coffee or something hot and he don't know how long he'd been wandering around out there. So the lieutenant was very, very, shall we say, hospitable, despite the fact that you're in a war. He made me as comfortable as I could be by saying that it was okay, let him dry out, let me get some coffee. And I started to take off my gloves, and this officer said, where did you get those gloves? And uh, they were a leather glove, soft leather, that went up over the wrist, right below my elbow. I was only a kid, so it was too big for me. But they were lined with a rabbit fur. And uh, I explained to him that they were my father's gloves. And he said, why would your father give you those? You know, we have gloves. I said, well, I have no father. But these were his gloves when he died. My mother kept the gloves till I grew up. And he used them in World War I. And I wanted to wear them in the World War II when I went in. That I had a vendetta that I wanted to keep. And so that's where the gloves came from. He seemed pretty much interested. He wanted to see the gloves. 
I showed him to him, he tried the one on. He thought it was pretty nice. I think he wanted to confiscate them, but he, like I say, he was a good man, a nice man. He gave me the gloves back, but he liked the story that I wanted to wear my father's gloves in the combat. He liked that. So did you get back, you said you were sort of, you know, lost there, a little wandering around. Did you get back together with... Well, he let, me, he let me stay in this command post there for, I imagine, somewhere around, uh, I don't know the hours I slept. Uh, I had some K rations there. I, as I imagine I might have been there two days, really, until I told him I want to go. Because I, not only was I confused and, and dazed and bewildered, I, I was scared. I was scared. I was frightened. And uh, I don't mind telling you that. I'm not ashamed of it. Uh, when I thought I was ready to go, I told him, i got to find my outfit. And he understood, so. You're on your own. But in the meantime, he'd been in and out, back and forth. But he was on the communications a lot, giving coordinates for artillery where to fire. And they weren't far off, because I, I could hear his cannons going off, and I could hear them exploding. So they weren't shooting very far away. It was just bang, bang. But uh, when I did leave the command post, Again, total confusion. I didn't feel too bad. I felt I felt weak. I felt as though I'm not doing my job, and I wanted to get back into the thick of it. But what I witnessed were men coming up the beaches, just as scared and just as confused as I was. And uh, one thing I'd like to leave you with is it just. I cannot watch to this day, I cannot watch a film, a movie of the war. Oh, I can watch it, but it's, it's cheap, it's not real. The one movie that came out was supposed to have been the real thing. It was close. You can't, you can't put the real thing on. You can't put the screens of scared, wounded men. You can't put the smell of death on tape or a CD. You can't wash off the blood that is somebody else's that you tried to help along the way or just picked up off the sand. Uh, and to depict on TV the invasion of Europe and assimilate combat is a challenge. And they do the best they can. But it's not the real thing. And what really irritates me is The graphic will come on and say, you know, three days later, and they'll show tanks driving up the beach, and weapons carriers, and trucks, and jeeps, and armored cars driving on the highways. That didn't happen. That didn't happen. The landing lasted until August. They don't depict that in movies. They don't tell you that's how long it went. And uh, in July, they were still dying on those beaches, being picked off by snipers and men who were behind the lines. Enemy behind the lines. And so the invasion will never be duplicated on film. Can't be. Can't be.
we've talked about some people being being wounded. Now you yourself were injured in. I was very very fortunate. I had scratches. I had a ton of bruises, but they don't stop. You know. I. Uh, that's another thing that. Sometimes I'll tell my grandchildren or I did an interview for my grandson for his high school and uh, some of the things I told them, I know they didn't believe. I know they didn't believe and I don't blame them because some of them are unbelievable, the things that you're able to do. When I tell people, I'll tell you, and I'm going further now into the war, I'm going into the hedgerows in Normandy. In those hedgerows, those Germans were so well dug in, so well fortified, and we're out there naked practically, no protection, in these little hedgerow fields, the farms were separated with hedgerows, not fences. They became great, great barriers, great forts for the enemy to pick us off as we crossed the field. These fields were full, literally full, of cattle that had been killed from our Air Force that was coming over and shelling in front of us to try and soften the enemy up. Those cattle, in June and July, hot sun occasionally, would just blow up, blow up until they literally burst. And that order, that order, I can detect to this day. I can smell that stench so bad. Now, if my grandson laughs and the kids in this class laugh and figure, you know, the old boy stretching the point, I don't blame him for saying that. But it's true. It's true. Yeah. War is bad. After, after the hedgerows, and that seemed like an eternity, they just peppered us. They just, I still don't know, just I, those infantrymen that would be so brave to walk over fallen bodies, to keep going, keep going, persevere under fire. Wow. It's hard to visualize, hard to understand. But they did. The patriotism in those days was unbelievable. I don't think we'll ever see it again. We have too many rights today. You don't have to do things today. You don't have to obey a command. You don't have to obey a charge. After the hedgerows, that was a pretty good breakthrough. That was when the first sign that the Germans were doing some pulling back because we had broken up their stronghold, we had entrapped some of the reinforcements that Hitler was sending down, and uh, being a small organization, oh, I did find a get back of my outfit. What a, what a great day that was. And uh, that was kind of like hitting your second, second win in the last three minutes of the game. You're ready to go and rally. So we're ready for the rally, and like I say, we broke through. And then I got a mission that my platoon was going to be the liaison between the British forces and the American forces. 
we went in in Omaha Beach, incidentally, and we were a side of the Canadians, and we were a side of the British. After we got in combat, the Canadians, somehow or another, we lost them, and we had direct contact with the British. But that's what we were to do. We can order the Virgin Territory, where the enemy was, we can order that territory. We put the enemy all the enemy strength, any uh, any caravans that we'd see of uh, vehicles, tanks. At the same time, keep communication with the British, so that they didn't get too far out in front of it and expose their flank. Nor would we get too far out in front of them and expose our flanks, so we could be pinched off. So we kept track of just how we were progressing one more than the other from time to time. There came a time when uh, this back and forth through this enemy territory to find the lead of the American troops and to find the lead of the British. There came times where we run in the pockets of Germans and usually had their armored forces with a lot of armor. Uh, they were deadly. The Tiger tank, we really feared that. The German Tiger tank had a large 88 millimeter cannon on the end of it with a big muzzle breaker on the front of it. Just to look at it was scary, I'm frightened you. But, uh, we managed to run into a few of those, and at one time we got cut completely off. We couldn't go either way. We couldn't go to the bridge, we couldn't get back to our outfit. And when I notified headquarters that I was cut off, the last transmission over my radio to my radio operator was, stay where you are, stay with your allies. Make contact with your allies and stay with them. Well, at that time, that order, that command, stay with your allies, was like saying, take a vacation. <laughs> because that's what we did. Uh, we kind of fell back to uh, work on our vehicles change some oil, clean our weapons. We tried to get more gas from the British. They call it petrol. They wouldn't give us a drop. But hey, we're in this together. They wouldn't give us a drop of petrol, gasoline, which we're running low on. They wouldn't give us any ammunition. They wouldn't even give us rations. And we thought, hey, who's the enemy here? But uh, that's the way uh, war is. You uh, take care of yourself and your men. So I just said, fine. We'll take care of our weapons, we'll clean up our vehicles, get what supplies, get some fresh clothing, find time to shave, find it quick, maybe we can take a bath. Because up till then, to take a bath, you took a bath in your helmet. And uh, I guess I can say this, but it was a good trick to take a bath in the helmet. You got your hot water out of the radiator of your tanks and armored cars, jeeps. Got the hot water out of those radiators. And uh, could shave and then take your bath where you strip down to your waist and you wash down as far as possible and then you uh, remove the boots and shoes, socks and trousers and you wash up as far as possible. And uh, then you wash possible. But then we put on dry clothes, that was a real treat, to be able to put on dry clothes. 
there were times, months at a time, that I didn't even get to take my boots off, change a pair of dry socks. And that was a lot of infantry men experienced that too. And they developed what was known as trench foot, where your feet turned blue, lack of circulation, not taking your boots off and your socks off. And uh, I eventually got that. I eventually got trench foot. And uh, eventually I, I managed to get by. I didn't go to the hospital or anything at that time. I managed to hang in and keep going until I got to St. Lo. The great battle, St. Lo. They had the Allied forces were really at a standstill there. The Germans were in full command of that whole countryside, had every intersection zeroed in for artillery. And they would send their artillery and mortar fire in at time. A barrage every two minutes, every three minutes, every minute and a half, whatever, on these intersections. You got the way you time them. The military police would time them. And they knew when there would be a let up, okay, come on, they let the traffic go through. Dodging the mortar holes, artillery holes. But then after about three minutes, they'd stop traffic and then it would come. Just as sure as God made green apples and you're gonna come in after three minutes or whatever designated time they had. I remember the three minute interval because it gave you a pretty good break to not have any artillery barrage for three minutes was a relief. But we were pinned down in St. Lo by artillery, particularly mortar fire. The Germans were so accurate with their mortar fire, I swear they could put a shell in your back pocket. I swear they were that accurate. And, uh, and they took their toll. But once we eliminated their observation point, which was a steeple in the cathedral in St. Lo. The Air Force had uh, strafed that. The church was practically all demolished except the steeple stood. And he was up in there, a sniper in observation. Until he was eliminated, uh, we were pinned down for days at a time. We slept in, well, we did sleep. We slept in the graves. The French didn't dig a hole for the grave and put a casket in it. They dug a hole. They lined it with concrete, put the casket in it, and just put a lid, a lid on top of the grave. Well, that made it easy for us when it comes to digging trenches and foxholes. All we had to do was remove the lid get that box or bag out of there and move in. And thank goodness for that. Pull an armored car over top of that grave, or a tank over top of that grave in between the tracks. And that was a great place to get down for cover. Because you weren't going to get killed unless it was a direct hit. Small arms were not going to get you. And that breakthrough, that's when uh, General Patton and his second armored division, known as Hell on Wheels, we were then assigned to them to spearhead their drive. And boy, they were a good wild outfit. It was a great ride. Sometimes we're going through virgin land, full speed, like a cavalry charge. Just chasing the Germans who were in retreat. Catching up with them sometimes. They'd run out of petrol, gasoline, and uh, 
since when we would get engaged in actual combat. And that wasn't our mission. We weren't supposed to be fighting Germans. We were supposed to find them, find them, report them. Other people would eliminate them. It got that we wanted to be in on the hunt, too. And uh, there was a wild ride up into the suburbs of Paris when we were commanded stop, stop. Oh, in the meantime, we traveled so fast and it, it took so much ground, we liberated so many little villages and towns that we ran out of maps. We used large scale maps and so in recon you needed those. Um, did it so bad that they would fly them up to us and drop them by uh, artillery observers that had little Piper Cubs. They dropped the maps down to us so we could <coughs> continue on going in, in our drive and uh, know where we were going and what sumo was ahead. But when it came to Paris, they wouldn't let us go in. Here's where politics come in the war. We find out that Roosevelt and Churchill and Stalin had sat down and decided that they're going to let the French liberate Paris. And that was fine, that's okay with us. That would be good for the French people to have their own General Leclerc. General Leclerc was a I think he was the Prime Minister, became a general, and he led his troops that were put in American uniforms and American vehicles and let them drive into Paris and do the hand-to-hand -hand fighting with the, whatever Germans were left behind. But they let them liberate Paris. But they didn't do that till like a week after we were already there. We stayed in a suburb known as Saint Germain, suburb of Paris. We stayed there in the meantime. Never did let us come to Paris. Instead, they said, go up with your allies to your liaison again with the British forces. And so we did. On the way back and forth with the two, two armies to, to uh, to uh, forces, the Americans and the British, in keeping their communications, we found ourselves in the suburbs of Brussels, the capital of Belgium. And so we thought, hell, let's go in here. Stop, don't go any further. The British stopped us. You're not permitted to go in there. Well, these are the people who wouldn't give us any gas, wouldn't give us any ammunition or food, but they're telling us we can't go in there. We didn't receive that too well and said, yeah, we don't obey your orders anymore and you help us. So we continued to go into Brussels even though we were told not to. The Germans were still in Brussels. They were still there. And Brussels wasn't uh, totally destroyed like parts of France was. Brussels uh, still had some high-rise buildings, and uh, we found our way to a, uh, a little cafe that was actually open, and it had tables outside on the sidewalk. Something new at that time for we Americans to see, sidewalk cafe. But uh, we sure were receptive when they wanted to offer us uh, something to drink. So we, uh, we had all we wanted, all the wine we wanted, they were giving it to us. They felt as though we were liberating them, which, which we did, but we were doing it against orders. I still have in my possession a letter that a businessman in Brussels was a very wealthy man, apparently, and I think he was in uh, cosmetics at that time because the name was Dubarry, and I understand it was a, a Dubarry manufacturer of cosmetics in Europe. 
But anyhow, Mr. Duberry, he took good care of my platoon to where he told us in the next building there's Germans. You Sir. come with me. Sir. So we went up. <laughs> this is the second reel of this interview. Where was I? Uh, you just were talking about Mr. Duberry. Mr. Mr. Duberry's apartment, yes, I'll never forget it. I guess I had an elevator that went right to his suite. And uh, I was very impressed with that. In the 1940s, I never knew anybody who had an elevator that went to their penthouse. But uh, he was apparently a very wealthy man. The apartment was finished beautifully. Showed no effects of damage from the war. And uh, he provided us with uh, rooms to stay there overnight. We kept most of our men outside guarding our vehicles and keeping them undercover because the Germans were on the same street, the same block where we were at the time. You are always looking over your shoulder. But it was a pleasure to actually sleep on salt sheets. But this man wanted to do everything he could for us. He'd go into the farmhouses during the day and collect some eggs from the farmers and brought back marmalade, which I don't like, but it was a real treat and a rather uh, exotic at that time to have some marmalade. He also wanted to, he said he would do anything in the world that I wanted, what would it be? He would grant it. And I asked him if he'd do me a favor. Would you write a letter to my mother and tell her that I'm all right? And he said, it would be a pleasure and an honor. Just give me the data. So I gave him addresses, my mother's name, I printed everything, and uh, lo and behold, he did that. My mother kept the letter, and I, I still have it. Uh, I read it about every 10, 15 years. <laughs> but uh, he was very generous. He also, uh, well, he was too generous because my driver, the corporal who drove my Jeep, incidentally, this time I became a sergeant, a buck sergeant, platoon leader. And uh, my driver was a corporal. Not every driver is corporals, but if you're the point chief, you're the first one in line driving into enemy territory. If you're the point driver, you're a corporal. So my corporal was so taken by this good living that we enjoyed for about four or five days. Uh, when I got my men together to to move on and go around Brussels because, again, the politics played its part. The British had the honor of liberating the capital of Belgium, Brussels. And so we pulled back and went around the city figured maybe just save in Berlin for us and we'll get the big prize, the big trophy. But uh, going, I'm not giving you the dirty parts. I didn't get into them. Covered a lot of ground. And we did a lot of liberating. The liberating of them small villages were so moving. There were no men in these little hamlets and villages. They had all been taken out by the occupation army, the Germans, and sent to, to uh, the slave camps. And once left behind were the women and children. And when we would go into that village, they saw the Germans running out. 
and taken off. They knew we were coming. They could hear the artillery fire in the planes or in bombarding in front of us. They were so happy that anything they had to eat, whether it was a half a loaf of bread, whether it was a half a bottle of wine, they were with just a flower. They wanted to give it to you. They wanted, and they hugged us. They hugged us and kissed us and we cried together. We laughed together. And they were that way town after town after town. They were liberated. Just to see no be no end to it. But we really enjoyed it. I was proud to bring a delight to those people who had been subjected to over four years of occupation army by the Germans. There's a point here uh, being unrehearsed here. I didn't, I failed to mention that during the hedgerows we came across a pocket of civilians And uh, these were six or seven French farmers, it looked like, about 60, 70 yards away behind the bushes, trees, sneaking around. And they recognized that we had these armbands on during the invasion. We had these armbands on that depicted the American flag. And. Uh, being a non-com during the invasion, you did take some French lessons just to learn a few statements, how to identify yourself. Je suis American. But these little farmers, they had weapons, but they didn't fire, and they didn't fire because they recognized the American flag. And we recognize them as being civilians because they also had an armband on with the letters FFI, which meant that they were free French underground. And uh, so we didn't fire on them. But there was a great expression of joy when we were hugging and kissing men because they were Frenchmen. We didn't see many of them. And they were the fighters. They're the ones who were performing sabotage during the years of occupation. They were blowing up trains. They were shooting at crossroads. They were they were doing the best they could to confuse and inflict some pain on the Germans, the enemy. And so happened that two of those boys, two brothers, of the same age I was, one a year younger and one a year older. And they were telling me about seeing the two sisters being raped by the Germans. They told me about their mother being raped and being beaten, kicked out of the house, out into the streets, literally. He told me about them stealing his bicycle, which was his only earthly possession, and he would kill for it, which he got to do later. But he wanted to know if he couldn't go with us, knowing we were reconnaissance and we were the lead, the point for the Allies. He wanted to go with us to help us because of his knowledge of the terrain, the high ground, the low ground, the rivers, the bridges, uh, the strongholds where the Germans were dug in. He knew all of these things and would be a big help to us. Well, I called my troop commander and asked if I could have permission to take these two French kids with me. And he said yes. I said, can I give them some uniforms? Because they're about the same size as 
me and my radio operator. He said, yeah. Give him guns too, give him ammunition, feed him, whatever. Uh, use them to your advantage. And I know, I know who those two brothers. One's name was Roger, Roger. The other one was Emil, Emil. Those two brothers are the reason I am living today. Their knowledge of getting me around pockets of Germans, their knowledge of where to go for observation, the high ground, take this route instead of Route B because that bridge is out, you can cross here. Saved me a lot of time and saved me a lot of lives by having them provide that information for us. We had a tour guide, actually, and uh, they were a big help. We became brothers. They took me in the family. So they, they were a big help all through that area that I told you we were making terrific advancements in short periods of time was due to their assistance. I did write to the embassy, uh, the French embassy in Chicago, back during the 40th anniversary of the invasion. I wrote to the French embassy and asked if they wouldn't recognize those two brothers with some sort of a decoration or award because they were very brave young men and uh, played a big part in, uh, in our success. I don't know if they ever got that recognition or not. I don't know. At least I made the effort. And I did. During the 40th anniversary, I did go back. Went back to Europe with another young man who was came to my platoon during the Battle of the Bulge. <coughs> Excuse me. He, uh, he had spent New Year's Eve in New York Harbor, ready to be shipped out to come to Europe. In the Battle of the Bulge, we lost so many men. Very heavy, and a lot of equipment, that these reserves were shipped over in a hurry to be replacements for outfits that were involved in the bulge. And uh, so I took him with me when we went back to Europe. And another friend of mine from Cincinnati, three of us, we did not take a tour. There were a lot of tours going back there for that anniversary, that great day. Uh, but I chose to freelance it. I wanted to get my own car with my maps that I used during the war, the route that I traveled all through that war, from the, from the beach to the Russians. I had that map, and I wanted to use that and retrace it and see if I recognized any. I knew there'd be a lot of big changes, a lot of cleanup, a lot of holes filled in, buildings torn down, they were practically blown down, a lot of destruction. So I go back 40 years later and I recognized, well, the beach, and you recognize the beaches because they left the, they left the shell holes there. Navy and the Army, uh, the Air Force bombs made some big craters on that, on that Normandy, and they let them there to this day. They've grown over with grass, but these, they look like little hazards in a golf course, but they were death holes at one time. The, uh, the concrete bunkers, 
that were destroyed by some bombs and artillery and hand grenades by the infantry. They're still there. And they got death written all over them. But uh, we did. I, we retraced my, my route that we took during the war up and through Belgium, into Holland, eventually into Germany. And that was an awakening to get on German soil. At that point, for a young man, I thought I'd witnessed everything you could possibly witness on this planet. But when I got on German soil and drove up in this Jeep that was under small arms fire, drove up in this Jeep and ran into what was known as the Sick Free Line. It scared the devil out of me. These concrete teeth, these barbed wire, these concrete bunkers still being manned by the Germans. They retreated that far. We run into this sacred line. They were as startled as I was. I know we were under observation. And it wasn't long later we started trying fire from the bunkers. But that just seeing that concrete, just seeing that thing before a shot was fired, startled me and my men. So you didn't have to give an order to withdraw. You immediately turned around. Just a reflex. Got to a farmhouse and set up a command post in the farmhouse on a sick free line. This farmhouse was a little town, Maastricht. Maastricht was the name of the little village. And uh, I was the ranking GI there, the staff sergeant. I uh, talked to the burgomaster, who was the mayor, and an interpreter tell him, or an interpreter, just a man who knew some German. And we were able to let the burgomaster know that we wanted everybody to cooperate or who we were going to shoot. And that what we wanted them to do was to bring all your cutlery from the kitchen, tell the women, bring all the cutlery from the kitchen, all the tools from the barn, bring all the tools that could be used for weapons, bring every camera in the village, and bring it to me right here in the town square, where I instructed a tank driver, when they get this piled up, you run over it with your tank several times back and forth and destroy it, so they can't use it against us or anybody behind us. You learn as you go. We find ourselves liberating little villages and hamlets, leaving little pockets of sometimes children behind, young boys who actually were enlisted in the Hitler's army, and they acted as snipers as we went through. They were still picking off our men walking in thinking that they were the village had been liberated totally. But the little youth snipers were still behind. And they were nasty. They were nasty. But there were young boys that were doing what they were taught to do. They weren't bad kids, really. They just were taught to do bad things. But uh, I'm trying to edit some of the things out of my thinking that I don't want to actually make, make public available because they're very, 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 very disgraceful, very immoral, very bad uh, acts of these Germans and what they would do coming into the town at night on patrol, uh, killing the women, and uh, 
we even lost one of our own men on an outpost to them. I'm going to bypass that part and tell you about the morning that uh, my friend Emil was in the farmhouse killing some chickens. We we're going to have some fried chicken to eat, some fresh meat, some hot, a hot meal. And in doing so, uh, he found the burgomaster, the mayor, uh, laying out on the, on the farm with his throat cut from ear to ear. And uh, when he's looking at him and trying to determine how it happened, and uh, he was being observed by other women civilians who later said that my man Emil had killed a burgomaster, killed a mayor, and that wasn't the case. I, uh, I asked him, and I said, now, you tell me the truth. Did you kill that man, or did you not kill that man? He said, Sergeant, now, this is all in broken English and French, and my broken French and his, my English. Uh, we're communicating, and he's telling me that the Germans patrol it at night, and that they killed him thinking that he's collaborating with us by surrendering all the smashed cameras and kitchen knives, and tools and forks, pitchforks, that he was collaborating with us. But uh, it wasn't a week later when we were being relieved from the Siegfried Line and told to move on through it and do some more reconnaissance work. And that Emil came to me with tears in his eyes and said, I killed that mayor. I did it. And he said, I had to do it because I, I made a vow that when I got on the German soil ever again, whether it be in combat or whether it be years later, peacetime, I was going to kill the first German I got. I could. So I said, I killed the mayor. I'm going to cut his throat. Well, I was somewhat upset that he lied to me. Kind of relieved to think that he came back and told me the truth. But I couldn't take him any further because he would be killing more people like I was going to do if they were going to fight me. To, to defend myself, I was going to kill him. But I didn't want him getting overly involved, which was obviously he did because he killed some other people too, in addition to the mayor. But uh, I had to send them back home, back to France, which was difficult to do. On the 40th anniversary when we went over, I contacted him, he and his brother, and we got together. I never had so many highs and lows in all my life. I went from crying to laughing, back to crying to laughing. It was painful, it was joy, it was ecstasy uh, to think what we did, bring back old memories, review some of the narrow escapes, review the injuries. Uh, he eventually lost an eye. He actually lost an eye because after he went back, after I dismissed him from going with me any further, 
he went back and joined the Free French Army and got back into combat. And uh, he then got killed, but he lost an eye and some other wounds in addition to that. He actually healed over in a hospital in uh, England. But uh, to him, I owe, I owe a lot my life. Now, we proceed through Germany, and here's when the fighting really got tough. Fighting, like I said, was not our prime mission. We were to reconnoiter, find the enemy, report him. It got to where we were fighting door to door in some of these towns. And here again, some young boys got involved, young German boys with Mauser rifles, and they knew how to handle them. It certainly was no delight to take them, to kill them. He didn't want to. If you didn't kill him, he was going to get you. Because he was upstairs and uh, he had all kinds of protection and observation. And when you're on the street, there's no place to hide. So you got to wipe them out. So the fighting in Germany was, was very, very difficult. It was like, it was like the beaches. But it was amazing how the German women, at a certain point as we would advance, when we got to the Rhine River, we had no bridge. So we were told to hold up. Set up, with the, set up a holding uh, position and report whatever you can see. Well, just sitting there is inactive. It's not good for you. So they gave us some missions at night to go across the river and bring back a prisoner alive. or go across the river, another mission was to go across the river and establish a fake, an artificial machine gun nest. Fire with some rapid fire weapons in the dark, anything, and retreat immediately back across the river. <clears throat> Those are both suicide missions. When you had to cross a river, the size of that river, the Rhine, in an inflatable boat. Fortunately, we had an engineer provide that. But the road across that river that has a current, you're just not going to land on the side where you were looking. You're going to be carried downstream maybe a mile, two or three. Now you're landing in an area where you weren't, that you weren't observing, you didn't have in your telescope prior to taking off. And you're doing this at night. You usually took off around one o'clock in the morning. 100 hours. Give me a military language. But, uh, but we did. We obeyed orders. And on two occasions, I went across that river with my men, not the whole platoon, like eight or nine men, two boats. Went over, and uh, on one of them, we brought back a prisoner alive. On the second one, he wasn't alive. He kept hollering and screaming and drawing enemy fire while we're in this rubber boat trying to get back to our side, knowing that sometimes you get killed by your own men coming across if you don't know the proper password. The ones on duty there in the holding position, they might fire at you, think you're the enemy coming in if you didn't know the right password. But this prisoner, 
insisted on screaming and howling and whatever, drawing this fire, uh, you couldn't afford to do that. You couldn't afford to, in a rubber boat, you couldn't afford to, inflatable boat, you couldn't afford to put up with that small uh, fire, so we had to just just put him under, put him out, to shut him up. He wouldn't shut up. Knocked him out one time. He gained his consciousness back. His hand was, was in the water. It seemed to bring him around faster, the water. And he started screaming again. And so, we weren't going to knock him out this time. We just, just drowned him. And uh, so we didn't accomplish our mission there. The one with the other, the fake machine gun is, I think that Colonel got that mission out of a comic book. Because uh, in the process of trying to set it up, we made so much noise and attracted so much fire that, uh, and this area's got minefields in it. One of our men, One of our men set off a booby trap, and that was a phosphorus grenade that exploded like in his face. And uh, it didn't kill him outright, but he had a piece of the phosphate embedded in his flesh. And you can imagine the pain. He wasn't unconscious. He's crying, he's screaming. You can't put this phosphorus out. You just can't take a canteen and dump water on it. It's not going to work. Uh, and it's in his face. So if you have water, you make mud, or you already had the mud from the elements, and you take mud and you plaster them with that cut off the air and, and that would slow down the burning in areas, but it didn't relieve the pain. And so uh, that was terrible. And of course all of this screaming, trying to help them, is only giving away our position. And the fire is getting pretty accurate. The, Crossfire from the machine guns. It's taken its toll. We lost some men that uh, we went through before I got the machine gun that set up. I only had an old piece of lumber that was going to be the gun sticking out of the foxhole. That was going to be my machine gun nest. But I never got to put it together. This came on back. From that time on, I have to admit, uh, any future uh, any future missions across that river, I put in hold. I uh, left left the briefing room, went back to my men on the shore of the river. I briefed them on the mission for that night. What time it would be? The report be ready face is blackened, be ready to go. But that's as far as we went. I went to the river bank. There was nobody knew if we were in the boat that went over or whether we just stayed there. Because it was early in the morning, midnight, one, two o'clock in the morning. But I wouldn't take my men across anymore. It was suicide and what we were going to accomplish. I brought one back. It didn't end the war. It didn't make it any easier for us. I'm not going back for more. That's all I was to it. I wasn't going to use my men because I just lost quite a few in the last mission. But, uh, that was, uh, that was a tough one. They eventually pulled out, the Germans were due from there, and we did cross up 
and Cologne. Went over to Cologne. <laughs> Went over to Cologne. I don't mind telling you this part. It's a little personal, but in the city of Cologne, which was totally destroyed, again, the cathedral, the, cha the, the steeple spire was still there. And they were using that for observation, naturally. And uh, I say they pulled out because the Air Force really pounded it. Pounded it pretty good. So they pulled out. We were starting to use troops that had crossed the river, wherever they found other bridges. The, uh, the Nijmegen Bridge up in Holland, which we saved later on. That uh, the Allies just poured over that bridge. So again, I repeat that the Russians or the uh, Germans were true. And uh, I wanted to go to this what was left of the spire of this church. Uh, being Catholic, I wanted to, I wanted to go to church. <laughs> and we hadn't had any church for quite a while. Any mass to attend, no services, no communions. I wanted to go to this church even though it was destroyed. And we did, again. Being a small group, you can do these things. Uh, I call it a privilege. If I'm going to be the front man, if I'm going to be the, uh, the decoy, the dummy, uh, I, I get privileges. And so I kind of came and went as I chose after the Brussels experience. Again, it seemed like the further east we would go, oh, let me think about this Brussels, or this Cologne, the church. I, uh, I knew from being cat, I couldn't pray there. You might as well go down on Vine Street and pray. But uh, nothing wrong with that, I guess. But uh, I knew that as a rule, that uh, in the priest's home, which was a rectory, the priest's home was always next to the cathedral. And that's where they kept the wine, the things you'll think of in combat. I keep in mind, I'm on the break. So I want to see if there's any wine here. So we go to the rectory, knowing that if I found wine, it wasn't blessed, and it could be consumed if it wasn't blessed. Indirectly, it's not blessed. It's blessed in church, at the altar. And it's no sin. So I find the rectory, and boy, we used to talk about to get to the second floor where his office was, the rector, and we found a lot of his pe pens, stationery, things of that nature. A nice clock on the fireplace up there, man clock, which we took. Uh, I survived the bombings, I don't know. But down in the basement, it was quite a revelation. Down in the basement where we found uh, two rooms, just like a, like a bomb shelter. Concrete walls, naturally the basement, concrete walls. And from floor to ceiling, on all four walls, were racks with wine bottles on them. And it was loaded, it was full. <laughs> so I thought, man, the jackpot. I'm going to be popular with my men when I show them this. Uh, so we loaded up, we loaded up on wine. And I said, I sent wine back to 
uh, saw you in charge of the motor pool back in Texas. He was a good friend of mine. I sent him a load back, and, and uh, so he, he sent me word up that he wanted to bring my Jeep back. He wanted to bring the Jeep back. He's in charge of the motor pool, master sergeant. He wants my Jeep because he's going to put something new on it. He's going to put something, something on it that could save my life. So he sent the Jeep back. When the Jeep came back to me, it was obvious that on the back of it he put a, a bracket that would hold a camouflage net, a big, huge camouflage net that you could put over top of an armored car or a tank. And, uh, and on the front of it, on the front of the Jeep, between the bumper and the grill where the radiator is, there was a, an angle iron brace, and a piece of angle iron went straight up from the bumper. And the, this angle iron was probably 50 inches high off the bumper. And it had a notch burned out of it with an acetylene torch. There was a notch there. Now this piece of angle iron was braced with two braces that went back to the frame of the Jeep. And I thought, what in the heck is this for? He said, it's a wire cutter. He said, the latest thing the Germans are using is piano wire. They're stretching it across highways. And as you drive down in a Jeep, a Jeep in combat never has a windshield up. You always fold them down and you have a cover goes over it. You can store supplies in there. But you never use a windshield. It's just, just a naked Jeep. But they were putting this piano wire out there to decapitate the drivers or passengers in these Jeeps. So I thought, oh, well, we never ran into that any place. That's a waste of time. But who knows? You never know. Well, the war goes on. I can smile now, but the war goes on, worse than ever, hand to hand sometimes, very bitter. But now we're combat wise. Now we know we have to change our socks more often, because my trench foot was coming back. We know we have to shave occasionally. You know, you gotta have your hair cut if it's only with a bayonet, because you're going to get lice if you don't. Because you just didn't have the courage of taking bath, taking showers. So, it was great when you come across the farmhouse. German farms were nice. You could, uh, you could, Occasionally find a little pig, a little hog, and uh, with some of our troops who were from Iowa, they were country boys. They knew how to slaughter a hog and how to dress it, and how to put it on a spit and barbecue that thing. So there were times you found time to do that. In fact, on the Elba River, which is outside of Berlin. On the Elbe River, at a farmhouse, in the holding position, we were all set to cross the river and go into Berlin. Again, politics. Don't you go into Berlin. Don't you dare go into Berlin. The Russians are going to have the honor of taking Berlin. Well, it just didn't seem fair to this kid that I'm thousands and thousands of miles away from home. I give up my life, I give up taking care of my mom and my sister. I've taken the chance every day of getting killed 
I've had hundreds of days of constant combat. Didn't know what R and R stood for. And I'm not in on the celebration in Paris. I'm not in the celebration of Brussels. And I'm not going to be in the celebration of the big trophy, Berlin. And yet, I'm on the doorsteps of every one of them first. There's other recons that did the same thing. I'm not the exception. I'm one of them. But I do have dates. I do have times that I was in St. Germain before the Allies, the times I was in Brussels before the British, the times I was on the Elbe River before anybody else, and the times I shook hands with a Russian. I was the first one in the Ninth Army to do it. And it was the most difficult thing I ever did was to shake this huge Russians to shake his hand because, like that very day, another point sergeant in his jeep advancing hit a Russian landmine, not a German landmine, a Russian landmine, a so-called ally killed him and his driver and his radio operator. Killed by an ally. That's pretty hard to take. So I didn't enjoy the meeting. I didn't enjoy the, the uniting of the two allied forces. I felt like we should keep going. I was so bitter that I felt we should have went right into Moscow and we could have done it. The Russians had nothing but wagons, sometimes just steel wheels, sometimes hard rubber wheels that were pulled with farm horses. That's their transportation, that's their mechanized cavalry. Wagons pulled with farm horses, big, huge horses. But why are we stopping here? We can take these guys easy. Let's keep on going. Not knowing that someday we'd have a Cold War with the same ally, the Russians. Not knowing that. But Eisenhower chose to stop. Oh, Roosevelt. No, Roosevelt died at that time. Yeah, he died before that. That was a sad day when he died. I remember the day. I'm in an underground factory that manufactured Volkswagens. The original Volkswagen. People wagon. Hitler promised one to every German family. And they had their own car, their own means of transportation. And they manufactured them underground because of the because of the bombing that the British did while they were fighting him, and then the bombing that we did after we got into the war. But we took this plant, this factory underground, amazing site. And as I remember, that's where, where I was when Roosevelt died. Just like today, I can remember where I was when John Kennedy was assassinated. I think a lot of Americans can. He was well liked. And of course, Roosevelt, to this day, with all his faults, uh, is a human being and paralyzed one of that. He's still the greatest statesman that we ever had. In my book. In my book. Well, maybe a good way to sort of conclude today's interview would be to um, talk about the, sort of sort of quickly what the war, how the war ended for you, and then also maybe just briefly what it meant to to 
to exit the military and try to reassume it back in this sort of civilian life, so what that was like in the next 10 minutes. Yeah, anybody, well, thank you. Anybody who witnesses this interview and thinks I was, you know, unjust, unkind, and not appreciating the Russians when we contacted them. I can understand that, but you have to stand, understand my position. My best friend, a little Italian boy from Philadelphia, was killed by a Russian landmine. You can't put it any other way. They were dominant. Dominic Spatea from Philadelphia. He married his high school sweetheart, childhood sweetheart, before he came to go overseas. He married her. While we were overseas in France, he gets a letter that his wife gave birth to a baby. This man loved this kid, loved his wife so bad, so much, so good. And child that he'd never seen and never got to see. And I should be receptive to an ally of Russia because his landmine killed my man, my buddy. No way. With that bitter feeling, with that bitter feeling, and the dancing and the drinking, Boy, those Russians drank a lot. When that was over with, got back to some semblance of war and peace. For several days, I saw the Russians raping German women. I knew German women, some of them were killed. Americans that did it. I didn't see them do it. I did see them at a party in my kitchen in one house, farm house, where they had music from someplace. It wasn't good music, like a cheap Victrola record player. It, uh, the party was going on and these drunken Russians had some women in there and Raping them right on the tables, just brutally bending them back, hugging and kissing. Or you wanted to kill them right on the spot. Not because they were Russians, but because they were human beings and they were mistreating other human beings. You wanted to kill them on the spot. It was hard not to. It was hard not to. But it got more difficult for me. It got more difficult for me. Because I too had a mind. But I was the lucky one. My mind blew me into a chicken coop. A big chicken coop. What's a chicken coop? It's a building that's made out of wire, like wire fencing, or little holes in it. Not a chain link fence, but a little thin wire that you could squeeze an egg through, but uh, not much more. And I land in there with the chickens, with the wire housing breaking my fall. I, as a result, didn't have any limbs tore off or broken. I. Uh, was paralyzed. I was wishing I was dead because I was alive and couldn't move. I thought maybe I was dead, but I recognized where I was. But why can't I move? So with that, I remember being put on a stretcher and taken back to 
medical center. From there, they put me on a stretcher and took me into a, I think it was a DC-4, DC-5 plane. That was an ambulatory plane that carried, carried the wounded back to the hospitals. And uh, that there was no seating in there, there was no furniture in these planes, they were just bare fuselage with straps hanging down and they would fit your stretcher handles into those straps and you were suspended in the, uh, in the stretcher. Some men could sit up, some had no legs, there was all kind of mangled kids in there. But uh, I got back to a hospital, I realized where I was, I was in a town called Nancy, Nancy, France, in a hospital there. And I was paralyzed there for, oh, five, six days, uh, with a lot of therapy, a lot of hydro, a lot of water baths. Uh, oh, and my trench foot got treated there, they're gonna cut off one of my one of my feet because it was blue, black. And I, there's no way, you know, you're not gonna do it. I don't want it. They said that gangrene could set in and it would go further on my leg. Take the whole leg, but not until I can't walk on it. So I wouldn't have done nothing to the surgery. By that time, I'm moving my arms. I'm moving my one leg pretty good. Ironically, in the bed next to me, there was a young soldier from Cincinnati. I'd never been to the town at that time. I never thought of even going there in my lifetime. But this young soldier had trench foot bad, and they wanted to cut off both of his feet. I thought maybe they could save one. Well, he didn't want to save any. He just wanted to go home with or without his feet. I'm not going to mention any names. Now, that boy lived in Cincinnati. Years later, when I got into Cincinnati to go to the university on the GI Bill of Rights, I wanted to look him up. But then again, I didn't want to look him up because he deliberately at nighttime we put his feet over the edge of his bed in the hospital with an iron railing to so just cut off the supply of blood again, cut off the circulation, which was his problem. Make the story short, because it's very, very bad. One foot was cut off below the knee. The other one they say. I saw him walking in Cincinnati. He didn't see me and I didn't want to make myself up to him. I saw him walking with this artificial leg below the knee. And uh, I wanted to go to him, talk about emotion. I wanted to go to shake his hand and hug him. But there was something about he was a coward to do what he did, just to get out of combat. He deliberately made worse an injury that he had and so that it would be amputated and he could get out of combat. He was probably in combat too long. I have compassion for him now. He was probably in there too long because I've seen other men with self-inflicted wounds just to go to the hospital in England and get out of the combat. Which is too much. Which is too much. I'm telling you, hundreds of days consecutive of combat. How many artillery barrages did you survive? Where you're to the point where you're panicking, you're crying. You wish that hole was 50 feet deep. Why didn't I dig it deeper? I wish this ugly heavy helmet was bigger now, you know. 
the things that go through your mind. Bad. Uh, however, when Hitler took his, took his own life and the war ended, I went back to my outfit. And this story I must tell you. Well, sir, we're going to have time. Uh, sorry. Okay. Mm -hmm. When I was able to walk and go in the overnight pass at the hospital, I decided to steal a Jeep and go back to my outfit. They felt that good. And the war was going to end. It was just a matter of formality. The students from the University of Nancy were parading through the streets singing with joy. On the way back, I took the fastest road I could and I went over the Autobahn, the superhighway in Germany with no speed limit. The Jeep I stole I had it floored all the way. I don't think it could go 60 miles an hour. But at one time, the Jeep buckled and I thought I blew a tire. I stopped the car as fast as I could to gain control and get out to see which tire blew, and it wasn't a tire. But I looked at the wire cutter on the front, and there, just as perfectly wound as you could, was wire around that wire cutter and it was about the size of my fist. It tapered at the top and it tapered at the bottom. But there must have been hundreds of feet of it there. And when I saw that, again, that scared feeling came upon me that that could have been the end. And I didn't want to go that way. Well, but thanks for sharing all your that experiences. That was pretty much, uh, that's, uh, I hope, I hope some people can enjoy this, get the benefit of it, not enjoy it, or was it meant to be enjoyed? I'm not here to entertain anybody. I'm just here to give you some facts and the parts of a word that you don't read in history books.